I happened to be uh, privileged to watch uh, David Wynn Miller testify at a trial uh, in a United States District Court in downtown Los Angeles in front of uh, uh, Judge Dean D. Pragerson. And Judge Dean D. Pragerson's father had been a United States District Court judge prior to him, and I believe at the time, in the late 90s, uh, 97 or 98, was sitting on the appellate bench in, for the uh, U.S. District Court. Um, and I do remember that uh, there was a way cleared for David Wynn Miller to testify on the final day of trial on a Friday on a four-day trial and um, testified after lunch in front of uh, the jury and um, was allowed to testify his theory about um, um, the language of the prosecutor's uh, indictment having been a fraud, um, showing all the, the nouns that were his verbs in the sentence. But the, the key one I remember was the word indictment. He uh, took the word indictment as it was in all capital letters on the page with and each capital letter had a space between it with an underscore under each one. And David Lynn Miller proceeded to tell everybody that there was 10 words there, but the word indictment wasn't on the page. Uh, the prosecutor tried to object numerous times. Judge Pregerson let him, actually, but David Lynn Miller uh, testify all his testimony with even using an overhead projector in front of the jury. Now, um, at the time, and he's probably come out and said that that was a success, um, we know that the prosecution was looking for uh, I think a 12-year sentence and a $1.5 million fine on the man who was being tried for tax evasion. It was, he was a high-profile case. He was a member of Scientology and had, um, I believe, caused a number of Scientology people to stop filing income taxes. And Scientology had, in 1988, cut a deal with the IRS so that we get tax-exempt status to turn everybody over that participated in any tax protestations. And so this was just one of those victims that Scientology had handed over. Um, but so the man um, ended up, uh, what we believe was, appeared, and I, and I can't confirm this now, but that uh, the judge issued a, a verbal indictment, maybe disputing or canceling, dismissing the first indictment without any of us catching it, and re-indicted him just enough time to get the case to go to the jury. And the jury came back and found the man guilty on all counts within about an hour an hour and 15 minutes of being given the case. So um, if, and then we worked on an allocution, which is another subject to try to help the man. Um, and that was only pulled off partially. But the, but the biggest part of this is, is that David Wynn Miller um, was sweating bullets before he testified. He really did not have all the core experience. You could tell by looking at his face. And he was a liar on a number of subjects. I can tell you straight out that we have friends that may still be on the call tonight that had him, uh, anyways, he made allegations about his health, about having uh, uh, one kidney and no adrenals, which is impossible. You have to have at least <laughs> one kidney and one adrenal to be alive. It was pure lie. He was probably under some kind of psychic surgery. And he made all kinds of other claims to me personally and other friends of mine that he had, his mother had been tied in with Madame Helena Blavatsky and was heavily involved in theosophy. So there might have been some psychic surgery done where he thought he had surgery and they cut him and whatever. The, the bottom line is is that he says he never slept. We have witnesses that said they've seen him sleep for seven hours straight, um, you know, and this type of thing. So the bottom line is he's enamored with himself, and it, it, his, his, his stuff is nonsense. And we disproved him, which I still can't believe he's around 12 years later, because in April of 99, he actually spoke at, in San Fernando Valley in California. We were at the conference, and we were there to help him. Uh, John and I had lunch with him, and uh, we showed him some things about some of the prepositions he used, one of which was the primary one was the word in, I-N. And we showed him out of Bailey's dictionary that the word needs to be used within or into, but in by itself is ambiguous because we showed him that as a prefix of a word, it could either mean a positive or negative. It's an ambiguous term. And so he um, took what we said, went in and spent the first hour of the, of the session after returning from lunch slamming John and me for not knowing anything. So the <laughs> reality is, is that we, we gave evidence as to, um, you know, we tried to help him. At that point, we realized he was just there for disinformation. So I can tell you, uh, from my personal perspective, it's 100% disinformation. I'm sorry to take so long on it, but that's, that's enough. Not at all. Look, I'm, I'm, I think no people would be grateful to hear from someone who has, who has known him firsthand, seen him firsthand, and to have that recorded and, and, and people aware. And I really appreciate that. And look, I'm, I'm sure you, whenever you do that, you know, you always are at the risk of people. The worst thing, a fraudster always hates to be exposed. 
Uh-huh. And if so, you may, you know, cop some flack for it. But and you know, they the best form of defence for a fraudster is is to attack. But I just I, I hope look, it's really up to people's own uh, abilities to discern what is and what isn't. I, I'm not going to do a song and dance. We don't talk about how many people have succeeded or not succeeded in the journey of UK. That's not what we're about. So the last thing we'll hear on these calls is, you know, 50,000 happy customers or anything. Like that. That's not what we're doing. But I, I, I hope people, in light of what you've shared and what we've discussed tonight, remember the danger out there of the easy fix, the the sweet sounding promise, the outrageous claim. We're programmed for that because they've trained us from a young age to believe that. They've trained us to shy away from the harder road. I just hope people will hear what you say and whether it apply to David Wynne Miller or anyone selling snake oil on the side of the highway of law that people are a bit more aware and a bit more savvy in the choices they make, including Eucadia. As I said, I don't want anyone to approach Eucadia with white eyes and say, I heard it's great. Come from the premise of being a cynic. Be a cynic. Don't believe it. You know, but above all, read it. Don't simply believe what people tell you and accept it on face value. Or don't read a page and then say that I've read Eucadia. You know, if you come to it, read it. Read as much as you can, and by all means, be a cynic. But take this as knowledge, as, as a tool, I should say. Take it as a tool. And Greg, thank you. Thank you for sharing your background and knowledge on David. Well, your last thing, Frank, just say that I, I attended, it wasn't just that I attended, I picked him up at the airport when he flew into LAX. We drove him around. We took him back to the airport. We were behind the scenes with him, and we all saw firsthand that it was all about the money. It was not about... It was not about helping people. It was about well, how much money he could make off each conference. And there's too many people like that, and I keep hearing of people, you know, offering huge amounts of money for things where they've copied people's stuff and cobbled it together. But again, I, 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 I can't. We, you can't save people. I can't save people. Nope. Come to this with an absolute healthy uh, cynicism, and please, I hope people are not sucked in. I wish. People are not sucked in because there's too many tricksters out there and um, too many people getting hurt. Greg, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, I see George is there. I'm going to try and unmute you now, George, and see if we can get you on and then see if we've got any more questions. Um, uh, and there's a couple of comments and questions there. George, can you hear us this time? George Allen. Fingers crossed, George, we can get you this time. Can you hear us, George? Alan? You might have your mute on, on your microphone. Can you hear us? Yeah, can't hear. We've lost uh, George there. Bit frustrating. Sorry, George, we tried twice. Maybe next time. Um, Look, there was a question here. Uh, uh, debtors BB asks this and then I'll get I see Connecticut's there and I'll I'll get get Connecticut on the line uh, debtors BB asks this question is the parasite class not the manifestation projection externalization of the ego and uh, until we dissolve the ego within how do we begin to address and remedy that which is on the outside that's an excellent, excellent observation. And I just want to say this thing. Uh, I've said this a few weeks ago. There was an amazing teacher by the name of Krishnamurti who passed away, sadly, from um, terrible cancer. And uh, there was a study of a fellow that worked in Hawaii in a prison psychiatric ward. And I refer to both of them because they said words of a similar nature, which I feel is quite profound. The comment was that the government 
the ruling elite, the parasites, whatever you want to call them, Roman cult, they're all labels. But those that inflict the injuries upon us, that do the worst things against us, exist because of us. We are responsible for their existence. And it is only when we accept our portion of blame and then move to our willingness to resolve and heal this world can we truly manifest a prayer that will affect change. If we disavow our complicity then we are not being honest and our prayer and our visualisation is incomplete. Now, it's an extraordinary thing for people to think that way. And it's an extraordinary thing for... for, for and Krishnamurti was an extraordinary man. And I, I thoroughly urge all of you to, if you can, go and see some of his work. It's amazing. This idea that we are part of the universe, we are part of the divine and that the, those people that are hurting us and attacking us really are a manifestation of, of ourselves. It, 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 some may say, well, this is gobbledygook. I mean, you're talking about stuff. You're not that person. You know, you're, you're accepting their problems. They're going to stand up for themselves. It's not it. What it's saying is that when you, when you wake up to who and what you are and you really are the divine, and you really are the earth, and you really are the singularity, you really are the animus, then you need, at that moment of realisation, to open yourself up to all the negativity. Look, the government is the way it is. Let's talk in another way. The government is the way it is because good people have done nothing. Benjamin Franklin, I think, even said it. I think he said it. He might have taken it from someone else. You know, all that evil required... might might have been Benjamin Franklin. I, I might be hammered for ascribing this to, to, to him and it was someone else. It might have been Jackson. But, you know, all that evil requires is for good people to do nothing. That's all it requires. So we have to accept, or at least our ancestors have to accept, a portion of the blame. The problems of the world today is because we keep electing crazy people into power. So once we accept that, then we can move on and fix it. And that is... BB, thank you for your question, and I hope I've given justice to the comment there. And yes, you're right. Ego has a huge part to play in this. It's why we have written cognitive law and tried the best to explain what we mean by ego. Look, we're getting into the last few minutes. I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, unmute Connecticut, and then I'm going to wrap up. Uh, so here we go. We'll just unmute Connecticut. Connecticut, can you hear us? Hi, Frank. Hi. Um, I wanted to make a reference to the comment that you were making about the law in Leviticus, the Talmudic law, and yes. the Testament. A uh, good example of t- Talmudic law is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And in Christ's law, it would be forgive them for what they do not know, or they yes. don't know what they do. So I just wanted to make an example comment on that. And I, I, I want to know if I understand this properly. So by the age of seven, we are considered by inter, interstate. So we have no true rights to ourselves, to our children. However, we can be dead, considered dead or abandoned, but yet we can still incur debt every month. How does the debt, how does the dead uh, person the estate, incur debt? The, yeah, the, the, what they regard as the estate continues. So what they did was they created states that never closed. When you think of probate, all that probate is is an equalisation of the estate. They're never they're folding estates into other estates, but the estate never ceases in their system. That's one of the great secrets. You think an estate's dissolved and uh, and completed and closed off? That's not how it is. A death certificate is merely uh, a, an assignment of the uh, of the uh, property back into or the sale of the property to some other administration. It's it's got nothing to do with 